G'day YouTube, getting there, won't be long, about a minute to go, Yanni's just getting his last things in order and we'll be with you soon. Shoulder pain relief exercises, the discussion continues today as we take a deep dive into stabilization exercises for the scapula. This is a really, really important phase of the rehab program. We're gonna be dissecting some of our favorite movements. We're gonna take you out on the gym floor to demonstrate and we're gonna talk about why this stuff is so important and a couple of key insights and big mistakes people are making. All that and more coming up right after this. We are the gym that teaches people how to move instead of just exercise because we believe that health is about performance, not just body image. And hey guys, uh, in case we haven't met, my name is Yanni Bormeister and to my right here is none other than Dr. Phil, aka Phil White Physio, if you want to follow him on Instagram. Uh, I am along with Rad and Richard, the um, founder of Unity Gym and the creator of the UMS, and Phil is just an all-round nice guy. 
and a very, very good physical therapist at that. Uh, now, today we're going to be going out on the gym floor and continuing this discussion uh, because it's something that has really, really been popular among our audience and we've had a lot of requests to sort of put this into a proper program. So we're really just dissecting that program. We like to dive a little deeper into the show and uh, give you guys a little bit of a history of how this all came about. Now, first and foremost, one thing that we haven't shared this week, which I think is really, really cool, is that this program, uh, which we're sort of um, floundering around with names, we're going to be off for about a week working on it, is, uh, has come off the back of, of our own personal experiences. Uh, myself and Rad have had both quite severe shoulder subluxations or dislocations, and so has Phil. Yep. And um, uh, I, I, we've talked a lot about, like I, I did my first sh really bad shoulder injury doing a, uh, a backflip off a wall. I didn't quite make the rotation. I uh, had to put my hand down to prevent myself from landing on my head. And um, it was just an acrobatic trick that I hadn't really mastered very well. And then uh, after that, I've done a lot of sort of um, missing racks with barbells. It was the most recent one when I was um, behind the head pressing about 65 kilos. I think that's just over 100 pounds, um, 120 pounds for the uh, US audience. And uh, uh, I missed the rack when re racking on one side and it, the barbell dropped. I wasn't ready for it and I caught it and it um, did all sorts of damage. You read the report. Um, yeah, mine was just a, a game of ultimate frisbee, which, you know, pretty badass compared to your backflips and um, lifting heavy weights over your head. But, you know, I was an ultimate frisbee player pretty competitively for 11 years and uh, just before I started getting into gym training and just took one guy sort of... We're both going out for a big catch, and um, yeah, one guy just rammed into the side, and it just drew my shoulder down, and yeah, I did a labral tear as well during that. So, yeah. and um, yeah, it was. Hey, don't sell yourself too short, mate. I, I've seen what you ultimate frisbee guys do. It's pretty freaky. It's awesome to watch. Yeah, but it lasts no longer. Yeah. <laughs> Beach volleyballs when you lose. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Um, and you know, so the the cool thing about what we're talking about this week is that this stuff has come from not just the textbooks, but also a cultivation of our own personal history through rehabbing shoulder injuries. And it's it's a very nice. It's like it, I say, it's nice. Uh, because we learn from our mistakes, but it's also nice to have walked the path, you know, and have to go through this sort of stuff. And and uh, and we've so far all of all three of us done so without needing or choosing or opting to have surgical intervention. We've gone the path of rehabilitation, um, despite being told that we'd need at least me personally need surgery from um, a variety of different surgeons. So, uh, not to say that it's. Uh, not a good idea to get surgery, but there are, um, in, in many cases, alternatives through rehabilitation and regression. We're going to talk about the, um, our theories on rehab uh, a little bit later. But let's, if we've got the camera set up, yep. we'll um, head out onto the gym floor uh, and we're going to demonstrate two of these scapular stabilization exercises. Sounds let's good. do it. Oh, P.S. guys, whilst you uh, catch me on here, we are going to try and catch up on a whole bunch of questions that have come through over the last couple of days. I know yesterday we were a little bit unorganised, disorganised, and we kind of rushed through it. Um, we will get there. We will get there. Uh, Phil, do you want to do me a favour and just run up and grab the black ball for yep. me? It's just a little bit easier. Well, I'm going to demonstrate on a bigger fit ball because I'm such a massive unit and um, a joke. I'm not really... <laughs> Josh, Josh is a more massive unit than me. I'm manly. <laughs> uh, all right. So, this exercise, this first movement, guys, it's very important that you understand that you don't need a lot of weight. Uh, in our program, I demonstrate with two kilogram dumbbells, and because I did the exercise for s so many repetitions to, to, to get Rad speaking right while he was talking over my demonstration, it gave me a good workout. That was with two kilos. Today, for the purposes of this video, because I'm a bit of a pussy, I'm going to do it with one <laughs> because I don't want to have to go through it again. I've just done my upper body workout. So, on a fit ball here, what we're working on here is and we're going to talk about this more once we go in back into the studio. In, in essence, in its most basic form, all shoulder rehab is a process of regressing back to the basics and retraining your scapular stabilizers and external rotators. And we like to think of doing that in movement patterns. Today is about muscle activation. This is the real basics. 
And in extreme cases, and usually Phil, Phil and I were having a discussion about this earlier, post-surgery is one instance where I can think that you would train a muscle in isolation. Uh, it's, a, it's, it, it's the base level of regression where you go right back to the basics and uh, it's just about muscle activation to prevent muscle wastage and, and, and a few other things. This is another example. What happens when, we're, um, when we sustain a, a, an injury, uh, usually, a, especially a traumatic injury, is the body can sort of isolate areas and lock itself down to prevent further uh, injury or, or pain. And along the process of that, we can sort of disrupt or weaken or interfere with the neurological pathways. Phil might correct me when we go back into the real science behind this, uh, but this is how I understand it. And our body kind of forgets how to do its job properly. And so what these base level exercises are doing is they're reteaching, they're retraining. One, they're strengthening the neural pathways. And two, they're really retraining um, the muscle and then we can progress from there into muscle movement or um, more um, movement patterns, more complex movement patterns. So this is called a low trap, a prone low trap row. And I'll show you the, the, uh, the tra trapezius in a second. I'll get Phil to point it out on my back. But we have, in essence, um, sort of seven trap fibers. It's a big diamond on our back that comes, the top trap fibers are in the neck, and then the mid trap fibers sort of run horizontally across the mid back or um, upper back in between your shoulder blades. And the lower trap fibers run right down sort of towards the lumbar erectors or the lower back. And what we're trying to do here is get the mid and lower trap fibers firing up again and doing their job. So what we do is, we retract and depress the scapula. I like to say, pull your shoulder blades into your back pockets. And then we row and externally rotate. And once we can't externally rotate anymore, so it's like a Cuban rotation here, then we really squeeze those shoulder blades down into the opposite back pocket. So my right shoulder blade goes to my left back pocket and my left shoulder blade goes to my right back pocket. You don't have to think about that. All I want you to do is think, Get those shoulder blades down into your back pocket, hold it for about three seconds, and then release the movement again and let them fully protract and elevate, or not so much elevate, but protract. Then we go through that again. Shoulders into the back pocket, Cuban rotation, so we're externally rotating, and then squeezing the shoulders back down again. If you do this correctly, and for some of you it'll be very hard because it'll be a, a weak movement pattern, a weak neurological pathway, uh, the upper traps should remain fairly um, loose and soft. They're always going to contract a little bit. It's almost impossible. It might even be impossible, uh, Phil might um, say that, that to, to completely switch off your upper traps and activate your lower traps because it is all one muscle system and that's how the body thinks to use it. But we want to get the lower traps more dominant in this movement than the upper traps. And many of us have very over-dominant upper traps and hold a lot of tension there, just lifestyle factors uh, contribute to that and, and our posture, things like that. So we're trying to really switch off those upper traps as much as we can and get those lower traps activated. The trapezius and, and movements like this respond very well to high repetition. So we usually prescribe about 15 repetitions, uh, even right up to 20 repetitions, because remember, it's not about intensity here. It's about volume. It's about repetition because we're rebuilding neural pathways or strengthening neurological pathways, which is the easiest way to explain that is the brain's connection to the muscle. Uh, the next movement we're going to do, and I'll get Phil to do this one because he's been practicing it a little bit and I'll talk through it, is the uh, ball. We'll do it over here. Yeah, do it over here. So what Phil's going to do here, first of all, the easiest version is starting quite low and he's doing the same movement that I did there. So he's retracting and depressing his scapula. So shoulder blade down into his back pocket. And he's going to just w work sideways, side to side, basically trying to generate the movement from his shoulder. So he wants to keep his elbow nice and stiff and straight. So the more movement from the shoulder, the better. It's not a big movement. You notice he's only moving a few inches side to side, but he's really working to hold that shoulder blade down into the pocket there so that it's nice posture. To, to progress this exercise, so we do side to side, then we do six o'clock to two o'clock, 
6 o'clock to 2 o'clock, up and down, and then we can do circles clockwise and then circles counterclockwise. And those are the different sort of sets that we do. And then to progress the movement to make it harder and harder, we take the shoulder into more and more flexion. So eventually you finish with the ball right up above your head, which is the maximum intensity for this movement. And it's much harder as we um, flex the shoulder, it's harder to keep it depressed and down. So the shoulder blade for most people wants to travel up as we elevate. And so it requires strengthening those neural pathways over and over and over again to be able to keep that shoulder back and down. And guess what guys? Guess what we have to do when we do a heavy bench press or a heavy overhead press? We gotta set the scapula back and down. If you caught yesterday's show and Monday's show, we took, Phil talked in depth about the vulnerability of the shoulder joint in essence. All it is is this bone floating around on the rib cage that connects to the body by the clavicle, the collarbone. There's not a lot of stability there. So what the, um, where the stability comes from is this um, unit of muscles, the inner unit and the outer unit of muscles. And if we don't know how to like set that, then we're really vulnerable and really prone to injury. So we'll go in and talk. So we're using a two kilo medicine ball here. If you got a medicine ball like this and that's great, even one kilo would do. But if you don't have that at home, then you can still use something like a, a soccer ball even. It's all about, it's less about the weight and more about that finer control. So Absolutely. I feel like just because you don't have this particular bit of equipment that you can't do it. Yeah, absolutely. I actually believe that it would be better to use something like a soccer ball or a uh, volleyball or something to start out. I find that the two kilo ball when you're first starting out for most people is hard to control. Yeah, yeah, yeah so. absolutely. All right, let's head back into the studio and we'll talk about these movements and why they're so important and how they fit into your rehab program. All right, so what I think is key to understand here, guys, is the concept of regression. Phil made a really, really good point uh, a, a while ago on the show when he said, um, or maybe it was just in, in, in a fleeting discussion, he said, I don't like the, 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 the use of the word rehab in my industry. Uh, I like to think of it more about a process of regressing back to the point that your body needs to get sufficient stimulus and not overdo it. And then it's a, a process of progressing back to where you want to get to again. Yeah, I think this kind of came from like this sort of, I think one of the hardest battles of, um, I guess, lifelong exercise, and especially when it comes to physio, when you've had an injury and you're trying to get back to something you want to do, I think one of the hardest things that you're battling against is human nature. Yep. Like, it's just so natural. Like, I found out myself in a big way that once you're, you're on a roll with training and you're really, you know, you're kicking goals and it's, it's easier to keep that going, but as soon as you stop, it can be so hard to get that momentum to yeah. get back into proper training. Yeah. And so I found that when I was going to see physios and I'd go into a uh, you know, a little room where they'd give you a TheraBand and teach you like one exercise a week. It just kind of felt like someone had just slammed the brakes on all of my progress in my sport and I just had to like sit in this little box until I graduated yeah. out of rehab. Yeah. And so I, I know it's a matter of just semantics, like the words we're using, but I do quite like this idea of regression and progression because it kind of always shows where like the that every exercise you're doing is leading towards getting back to what it is that you want to spend your time doing. And so, uh, yeah, I guess it's it's just the, the way that I like to think about it. And, and when I have um, patients coming in, it's, it's all, you know, each step is there for a reason because we want to get back to here and we're starting here. You've got to just keep taking those steps instead yeah. of just being in rehab and then suddenly you run against the wall and you're up here. So. Yeah. And I think that that's one of the things that we, I, I love about um, yourself and some of the practitioners that we've had the privilege to work with is that, you know, I used to hate as a trainer being a personal trainer and sending someone off to see a physical therapist and them coming back saying, oh, he told me not to exercise for the next four weeks or two yeah. weeks or yeah. something, which you know, to come to the like, gym. Which and I, it's like, I think is a dying sort of um, approach yeah, now and, yeah. and the, all the training in um, is... is coming through is all about keeping people doing what you want to spend your time doing yeah. but yeah it's a real art to trying to get uh i guess relevant exercises then it, you can gradually increase and and i was talking to richie behind the mic about uh about this uh, behind the camera about this earlier when you Just when you're picking on, exercises my notes outside, guys. for your, your patients like it you know you might pick uh one set of exercises for you one patient who's uh, wanting to get back to, you know, for me, beach volleyball where I need lots of power overhead. But that might not be as relevant for, you know, your average Joe who's not doing 
you know, that kind of movement. So it's all about finding that, that relevant, interesting and engaging exercise that is going to overcome that human nature of <laughs> yeah. not being bothered to, yeah. to do the things that we need to do consistently. Because at the end of the day, it's something, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. When we were talking about the uh, guy with a couple of ACL injuries and talking about whether or not you should go back to playing sport without ACL, it's that idea that you have to be kind of committed to doing something to keep your body active and, and, and supported. So yeah. Yeah. you've got to find... I, I love I love it. So. I love the concept of um, there's no rehab, only regression. And I said to you the other day, we're going to get it printed on a T-shirt. It's it, yeah, you heard it here first. Space. You heard it here first, guys. <laughs> um, okay, so look, um, one of the biggest mistakes that we see people make is that they narrow the focus to uh, rotator cuff. So uh, it's referred to as ER and IR, internal rotation and external rotation movements in isolation to rehab the shoulder. Now, those movements certainly play a role in a strength training program to a degree, but what we want you guys to understand today from the exercises that we've demonstrated is that the, the shoulder is a unit and it's a, it's, it's a system that requires a lot more than just internal and external rotation and it does a lot more than just internal and external rotation. So just quickly give some insight into what those movements are doing and why they're Im as important, if not more important, than internal and external rotation. Yeah, so I guess I talked about the other day how I, I, I wish that the rotator cuff had been named something a bit different because it really uh, just puts something in people's head about what it is. And so again, just to um, recap, it's a system of four muscles that its whole job is to keep the ball in the middle of the socket. Now, it does when the you... The ball being the top the of the humerus the bone here. Yeah. Yep. So uh, when, you th when you think about that, like the... Its, its job is going to be sort of rather than just rotating, it, it's more about kind of holding on and stopping different glides of the, that humerus around that socket. So because, be sorry, because the, the thing doesn't just rotate and move this way, it also glides. Yeah, so the, the bone is not wedged into a socket in the shoulder. There's a lot of glide. Yeah. So when you're doing a push-up, if your pecs are pushing, you're going to get a rotational movement. So this horizontal adduction, but you also get an anterior glide. So what the rotator cuff's job is to do is to stop that um, that anterior glide, that anterior dislocation, and just get that nice uh, horizontal adduction movement. So, yeah. again, that's its job. So, when we think about how we're trying to train it, uh, you know, a lot of rehab, just like that rehab that people use, is, is just this external and internal rotation. Now, the muscles that are really good at external and internal rotation are your pecs and your lats. For internal rotation, like you, when you, you see those swimmers with the big V shape, yeah. those like you're getting that good internal rotation. That's all that the, the lat that's really good at producing force through that movement. And what your cuff is trying to do throughout that time is get the ball centered in the middle of the socket. But when we go and try and train rotator cuff, everyone just spends the whole time doing internal doing this, and especially rotation. when it's down in tandem, yeah. then you're just using your pecs and your your lats. Like you're not yeah. <laughs> you're not even targeting the rotator cuff. Yeah. So what we need to be able to do is when we're playing sports or we're doing different activities is is the rotator cuff needs to be able to uh, be a reactive structure rather than a pre-programmed structure because you need to be able to uh, like it needs to be able to do its job without you thinking okay contract yeah <laughs> like yeah. it needs to be reactive it's so, a subconscious muscle system yeah you don't, you, it doesn't it's not it's not sort of like you think push like yeah. you, when you when we push something and we think, yeah. okay, let's move that object, the rotator, we're not thinking, okay, rotator cuff, stabilize whilst I push. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So the reason why we're doing these exercises, which are, um, they're, they're really a lot targeted, as, as Yanni was saying, to the muscles that keep your scapula in a nice position. And I was talking the other day about how uh, your rotator cuff, it works more efficiently when it's got a nice, uh, in it, when it's in its ideal position. And when you start to get out of that position, so that winging scapula or the really protracted scapula, then the rotator cuff has to do more work to get the same desired result and often doesn't quite get as good a result because your scapula is no longer rotating as it sort of should. So you've got these muscles that are helping keep the scap on the middle of, um, in the right sort of spot in your back. And when you are lifting your arm, it does need to get a bit of rotation, so that's fine. But when we're training this sort of like, shoulder blades in the back pocket. It's, it's getting that activation through those muscles to try and give your rotator cuff a stable point so that it can then have something to hold on to while it, the other end of it uh, is, you know, yeah. yeah. It's like if you were, yeah, uh, I don't know, trying to like do an exercise and you had a, <laughs> instead of having the earth, like a, a band tied to a, a pole, you've got it tied to a, a, a swinging piece of rope or something. When you've got these two moving <laughs> points, it makes it really hard to control anything. So you really need that nice stable point and then yeah. a, 
to then have that moving point. Yeah, so yeah. the um, the one on the the ball, that's all keeping that shoulder blade back pockets. And same when you're starting these ones, it's it's kind of teaching that reactive activity through your rotator cuff because you're getting this movement where you're controlling your scapula, but you're also having to then keep that ball centered. Yeah. So. Yeah. Beautiful. Now. Uh, we spoke about this, I mentioned this a little bit out there, and this is probably the key insight that I want you guys to take home, which is, you know, that rehabbing the shoulder in, in, its, in its most basic form is really a matter of, re, like, I guess, in some cases, retraining, depending on the severity of your injury, whether it was trauma, things like that, retraining the shoulder stabilizers and the rotator cuff to do its job properly. Um, and also, if you haven't had like a severe trauma and it's an acute overuse injury or something, sort of... Um, building stronger neurological pathways and sometimes even yeah, this hypertrophying. Is, this is something that I muscle. wish that I had a mic out there so I could start talking about, and it's probably a whole episode in itself, yeah. to be honest. But um, yeah, it's such an interesting piece of the, like, getting the the body working as it should. And so I'll just do a really sort of quick uh, kind of de uh, explanation of what this sort of neural uh, side of things really entails. So uh, you've probably heard the term. Uh, neuroplasticity. So that's kind of the talking about the brain's ability to, uh, I guess, change and adapt. And so this really is important for, uh, I guess, every sort of thing that we do. So the way you think, the way that you <laughs> do everything, but particularly in the body, when you, um, when you have these kind of patterns that you train over and over again, you can think of it like, I've, I've used this analogy before, but if you've got this big sort of flowing river, where you've got lots of water flowing down this river, and so this is a really sort of ingrained uh, thing that you find very easy to do. So when you start playing a sport, you, you know, you, I don't know, say playing football, you start practicing your kicking, and at first it's a bit clunky and awkward, but then after a while you can, you know, you can be running and <laughs> you can do it without thinking. It's Pass this thing the ball that you, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, this yeah. thing that your body is just so practiced at doing. It's really easy. So you can imagine that that sort of water flowing down the river. But then when you try and do a new activity or a new like when you're trying to learn handstands for the first time and you know you can't believe how you have to think about your legs and your arms and getting your you know tucking yeah. in your, your belly while you do it it's sort of all these different parts that you haven't really spent your time thinking about and so your body's not like your brain's not very good at, at getting your body to do it so you can imagine this sort of uh, just little creeks sort of flowing down the stream but as you practice these things more and more and especially with frequency it's sort of like turning up this tap and more and more water starts to flow through it and becomes a really ingrained yeah. easy to access sort of movement, movement. so yeah. with yeah. Uh, the way that this program is it's all about kind of getting lots and lots of reps to send a lot of that signal so it becomes a a movement that you don't have to think about because when you're in the gym, the last thing you want to be thinking about when you're trying to go for, you know, if you're trying to hit some PBs is, you know, thinking Setting about your shoulder blades. Like, right <laughs> you want to be exactly. like, you yeah. want to be pushing hard. You want to be doing something else rather than thinking about your shoulder blades. So that's why it's so important to really uh, key into these things while you're, while you're learning them, really start to practice them. Uh, so you don't have to think about that when you're out in the gym floor. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's just that's a, a, that's that's and that's something that's so important to understand. We I talk about this a lot, which is that you know there's there's six different strength adaptations, and the majority of them are not the actual tensile strength of the tissue becoming stronger. It's yeah. it's or size. It, it, they are all happening in the nervous system. The yeah, nervous we, system's programming, the coordination, all sorts of stuff like when that. When I was doing my exercise and sports science degree, uh, we went through this a lot, and one, we actually had to do an experiment during our semester where at the beginning we had to test bicep curls in your right and your left arm, and then you had to spend six weeks just training your non-dominant arm. So for me, I just trained the, the left side the whole time. You probably can't tell. Uh, <laughs> but at the end of that time, you basically, that six weeks, you're really not getting enough time for your muscle size to adapt. Yep. But what you're getting is the ability to uh, to use larger and larger motor units. So that's a pretty complicated thing to get down into. But basically, um, you're, you're able to access this strength that your body already has. And if you're in a you know life-threatening situation, you can kind of access because you've got so much neural drive. But basically, when you're training just that one arm, you're getting these signals that actually go to both sides because yeah. of the way that the nerves are sort of set out. And so by the end of it, when we retest your um, both sides, you're not only stronger in your left, but you also get stronger in your right you're just right. because you've got this neural drive, which is kind of... It's like just turning yeah. the tap up on that flow of neural activity, that water that you can just yeah, access. That's right. Strength, and I, so. I, I, I um, did that um, very, very heavily after I had a knee reconstruction and I couldn't train my right knee really well. I continued doing 
pistol squats and all sorts of stuff with my left leg and uh, it helped to yeah. develop strength in that right side. Yes. Now, we, we, we got to wrap this up um, because we got to wrap up the show and I did promise that we'd go through um, and give some shout outs and answer some questions. So we're going to work through this because we've got five pages and I, I, I promise everyone that we will get to you. Um, so we've had quite a few comments here from Rachel Eastwood Stone, who's part of our um, Inner Tribe Movement Mastermind uh, and UMS program. And Phil, ha it looks like you've, yeah, I've answered, answered yes. her yeah. in person. So Rachel, I won't repeat your questions, but thank you very much for continuing to ask great questions and, and supporting the channel. Um, there's four there, three there, three there. Okay, let's move over. Uh, we've got from Alex Kazar here. Thank you. Thanks for the helpful step-by-step -step exercises to work on ring muscle-ups. I can do a muscle-ups, but they're very sloppy. Now I know how to train them. And that was in response to the strength training introduction to gymnastics rings video we did quite a while ago. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, I'm super glad that you got something out of that video. Uh, Michael P, I am into calisthenics and been doing it for nine months. My strength progress is okay, but my weakness is flexibility and mobility. Very common problem, my guy. This is in relation to the 10 minute lower body warm up um, ultimate routine we did a couple of weeks back. My um, I have a question on how stretching should feel. The examples below are different stretches that I experienced. Some areas like my squat and Cossack exercises feel really awesome in pushing my full ranges of motion and I have seen fast progress in getting low to the ground. Other areas like my hamstrings feel like they are pulling really tight when doing exercises. I am, tr I am trying uh, to not push too hard, but the stretch feels different. It feels very tight and under a lot of tension and not the releasing feeling like with the squat. The progress has been very slow and not improved for a week, a few weeks now. My main hamstring exercises are the Jefferson curl, single leg good mornings, elbow to toe. Still working on this, cannot get my elbow to toe at the moment. With my shoulder mobility, it feels like my joint locks my range of motion rather than my lats or chest muscle stretching, not getting much more progress with this mobility and is affecting my handstand progress. Is it normal to experience these different types of stretching sensations or am I reaching uh, my natural limit? I'll go first because I had a very similar experience with my hamstrings and still do. My theory with hamstrings is that they're a very fast twitch muscle fiber and they are designed to produce a lot of power and they're just not really designed to be super bendy and flexible. And I don't know whether that's, uh, Phil might, um, might say that's not true, but I found it very hard to Im improve flexibility in the hamstrings and uh, it took a lot of, a lot of, a lot of re repetition and it also takes not pushing them too far, you know, because you, you may have posture like myself that uh, I had lower cross syndrome where I had a very flat back, um, a very sort of my, um, my bum was very tucked in, my pelvis was um, posteriorly tilted. Uh, is that right? Yep. Yep. Posteriorly tilted. Uh, I had very strong abdominals, very dominant ab muscles and uh, very weak glutes, very tight hamstrings. And it just took a long time to correct that brother. So perseverance was key for me and learning how to hit it from different angles, different types of stimulus, things like that. In regards to your shoulders, and I'll let you dive in here in a sec. Um, shoulder mobility has a lot to do with thoracic spine mobility. And if you're feeling like it's like a joint restriction, you're getting to a point where there's not a lot of pec stretching there, I'd probably um, give the shoulders a bit of a break, mate, and work on having a look at how your thoracic spine is moving. And if you're not, you know, because to get full flexion in the shoulder, you have to have the ability to extend through the thoracic spine. And uh, I would sort of look at that. Remember, treat the body as a system. Um, and, and, you know, some people have, there's, di there's different m structures of the glenhumeral joint. And, you know, I have, you know, what showed up in the MRI report the other day. What was that? So the acromion, which is like the top bit of the, um, the scapula that sits out there, the, end, the most bony point there, slightly. So everyone has like slightly different uh, bone shapes and yours is sort of more hooked than Yeah, than that's the right, which kind of exposes me potentially to a little bit more injury, uh, wear and tear when trying to do heavy stuff overhead, you know. So you've got to work with what you've got to a degree, but you've also got to look at the body as a whole. And if you're not getting a good stretch in the pecs, then you may just have to tweak things yeah. a little bit. My you quick know? two cents on like the hamstrings first up, uh, have a look at the what we were talking about last week with the sort of loaded stretching and 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 the th like what builds flexibility is that ability like your neural adaptation to being in those different ranges and the strength and the sort of 
subliminal trust of your body that it can handle those end ranges. So have a go at like there's so much research looking into the like eccentric. So going even it's amazing like even doing um, Nordic hamstring curls which are not at end range. Yeah. Like even building up that eccentric strength through there has kind of been shown to increase your hamstring length. So it's a, this sort of interesting like uh, it's a bit counterintuitive, but uh, start building up the eccentric strength through your hamstrings and see if you hit some um, hit some goals there. Also, neural tension can be a real thing that makes uh, going into hamstring stretches quite uh, unpleasant for people. It feels a bit different than your general satisfying muscle stretch because you're getting this really uh, intense neural stretch. And, that, and you can kind of have a little play around with your foot positioning and your head positioning. And when you're in those positions, if that makes a big difference and makes it uh, more comfortable, then have a look at... Uh, potentially some uh, neural, gentle neural stretching or, or flossing exercises that um, yeah, I'm sure you can find online. Also with the shoulder, uh, I guess if you're getting into that position that's feeling blocked, then as I was talking about before with your scapulas need to be able to um, rotate. If you're really locking your shoulder down, you're not letting any, uh, like you're going back pockets to the extreme and you're not letting any sort of movement in your scapula happen, then you're going to be basically trying to lift your arm while your, your scapula is not uh, not moving so you know relax a bit see if you can just get that little bit of like shoulder movement uh, on top of that thoracic mobility then you should be able to um, get the ball the, uh, the socket facing up a bit more and the ball going up so try that um, just very quickly before we continue uh, Richie I'm happy if you got have you got anyone booked in any treatments not immediately no. not immediately you, you can go for another 10 15 yeah, yeah, minutes yeah cool. Richie, if you want to just um, bring me down the iPad, I'll wrap up the show because Richie's got to go and teach a class in 10 minutes and I want to give him enough time to do that. We've still got three or four pages of these <laughs> and I would like to try and give everyone the love yeah. to get through their questions. So if you're okay yeah, to do yeah. that, so yeah, nice. rather than rush through it, um, let's, do, let's do this. And that way we, we, can, we, can get, we can give everyone the love that they deserve for... Uh, for reaching out. Are you cool? You're, yeah. you're all right with that? Thanks, I'll, I'll wrap it up, Richie. Thank you very much, mate. Okay, so next we have uh, Babosan3121, who in response to the 10 minute upper body warm up, the ultimate routine has said, honestly, one of the best channels out there. Love your work, mate. That is so cool. And thank you so much because honestly, uh, we, um, you know, we don't we don't really know how well the, uh, the, the the content we're creating is received until we hear comments we like think that. It's pretty good. So we we <laughs> think it's good, yeah. But you know, so we really do appreciate it. And yeah, uh, just we say, like, if you think it's useful and you like share it with some friends. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Yeah. And smash the like button uh, um, yeah. because it helps with the algorithm and gets our stuff out there to more people. It gives more people the chance to learn what you guys are learning. And please comment where you're watching from in the world because that. That really gets us excited as well. We like to see that our message is reaching far and wide and further than our little gym here in Sydney um, sort of would uh, suggest. Uh, okay, so next one, and this is something that we were just talking about this morning. In response to the golfer's elbow, the seven yeah. steps to overcoming elbow pain, our most successful video ever, because it's one of the first videos we ever produced. It's had like 155,000 views, uh, and it's a terrible video in regards to the fact that we filmed it on our iPhone, and there wasn't a lot of thought behind it, but it's, people still love it. I have a question. I quit working out for two weeks and the pain in my elbow gone has gone. But when I start stretching and do these exercises, my elbow starts hurting again and the pain is like it was before. Should I keep doing the exercises or should I wait till the pain is gone and try again? Now, before oh, Phil boy. dives in, yeah. because this is exactly <laughs> what we were talking about this morning, yeah. the, the video that you're watching, uh, Massimo, is very dated and it's an old routine that we threw together that worked for us. Since then, we've produced two more videos one of which was off the back of a conversation I had with Phil, just like what I had this morning, and he helped me, me get a better understanding of what was going on to, to rehab my own golfer's elbow. And I urge you to just run a search. If you, if you catch this, you may not, but anyone else who has or experience from golfer's elbow, um, uh, do a search on our, um, on our channel and watch the more recent videos first. The older one with 155,000 views, although it seems to be the most popular one and it's the one that went viral, it's not the best one out of all of them. Okay, so Phil, why don't you dive in here and explain quickly, as quick yeah, as you look, can. Uh, ten and off these are so challenging, so they can, the common ones that we see, especially in the gym, are the, the ones around the elbow, but also with the Achilles or patella, so the front of your knee. Uh, so 
so common and so challenging to get on top of because it's um, it doesn't act just like a muscle tear where you have like a really kind of uh, obvious level of um, like an obvious time of healing like it's not just like you can leave it for six weeks the muscle heals up and it's good to go this thing is coming from like a like a overloading of the tendon and then uh, an inability to like it goes through this whole process where it starts to basically uh, it, it tries to fix itself, but it doesn't do a very good job of it, and it starts to make a bit of a mess of the tendon. So the rehab approach is really tricky because you've basically got to try and hit it with optimal load consistently and build it up over time to get back to what you're doing before. So it's it's if you do too much, it makes it worse. If you do not enough, and if you just totally rest, it also yeah. makes it worse. Yeah. So and you just... said something that I thought was key here, which is that there, it, it's it's a balance to get the, to get it right to re repair a tendinopathy. It's a balance of not just the stimulus through exercise, but also other lifestyle yeah, factors like yeah, yeah. what you're doing in your everyday life and what you're eating to. to fuel and furnish the repair of your body, how much recovery and sleep you're getting. You know, there are all these variables. Yeah. That, that and with like with over with the overloading or underloading of your tendon, you you it can you can go in the gym and be really controlled about the you know the forearm exercise you're doing, but then if you you know you go home and you you spend the whole like night playing you know first person shooter like yeah. computer games and you're clicking through your elbow then you're yeah. like overloading, you're overloading the, sort of the lateral elbow so That's like right. it, it, you just got to keep in mind like you know one of the classic ones here is guy comes into the gym he trains really hard and then he goes and uh, does bouldering on top of that and so yeah. he's like oh yeah. but i'm keeping like i'm really careful with my training but then he goes and does two hours of bouldering yeah. and then you know what so. what <laughs> blew my arm out the first time which was which was the worst tendinopathy i've ever had was when i took up golf and i was training in the gym five days a week religiously. I was training six days a week religiously and then I traded out my Saturday workout for golf days. And, and what you do when you start a new sport, you wanna get as good at it as possible quickly. So I started training twice a week, uh, playing golf, 18 holes, and it just destroyed my forearms. And the really completely. interesting thing about the golf and why it's kind of called the golfer's elbow, which I think people don't really understand so much, is like, it's not that you're gripping super hard on the, um, on the actual I don't play golf. Club. The club? Yep. yep. Club. Yep. <laughs> That's terrible. Uh, <laughs> it's not that grip which you'd be training in the gym. It's the combination of um, not only the grip, but when you're hitting the ball, uh, to keep your elbow from gapping, because as we talked about before, you're active and passive structures. You've got ligaments that keep your elbow joint together, and you've got the bony congruence, but also those muscles uh, acting as a, a shunting mechanism, so they keep, like, it's kind of contracting to keep that joint together. Yep. So you've got this... Uh, the stress of hitting the ball where you're it's kind of stressing that shunting mechanism so in the gym you really don't train and, and develop the muscles ability to do that yeah and so that's why it's totally unprepared for this sudden like other stimulus so it's yeah. quite an interesting one where it's yeah. like not only do you need sort of like muscular strength and endurance but also it's really about the way that you actually load up your muscles so yeah. if you start loading it in a completely different way than usual then it's it's although it's strong in other ways, it's not going to be adapted to that. Yeah, so. that's exactly Just right. That's very good. Okay, Pharaoh, um, thank you very much for your love and support, brother. You always do your little smiley faces and and uh, emojis, and I love it. Uh, Claire Blaber, um, Blaber, I know. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, in response to one of the knee uh, videos that Rad did, I know I'm a little late to the game, but in response to the Fitball Curl alternates. I sometimes use a foam roller for a leg curl. Yep, that's absolutely fine. It's just a smaller uh, fulcrum point, a smaller rolling point. So it actually makes, it increases the difficulty of the movement a little bit, uh, but it's totally fine to do. I use it as a, a, progr um, a progression from the fitball. Uh, the M um, Res, uh, in response to the golfer's elbow, it's great video. How can I know to go to the next phase? Uh, I've, I'm asked this a lot about these golfer's elbow videos. Really, um, and Phil was the one that taught me this, you want to you want to go based on how your body's feeling and responding. You want to progress and you want to experience up to, you said a while ago, like a 4 out of 10 on well, the discomfort yeah, level. Yeah, so it's it's a tricky one because you got to look at the pain you're experiencing at the time of the exercise and then you've also got to follow it up with your 24-hour pain. So when you wake up the next morning, are you feeling it? Yep. And so generally, the like when you're doing the exercise, about a... A three or a three to maybe a four out of ten. Two two to three ideally maybe a four out of ten is probably fine. But then you've got to feel what the pain is like the next day. And if it's feeling sore from just just waking up, then you've probably overdone it. Yep. Um so if yep. you were at a four, 
cut back to it to yeah, that's right. <laughs> see how it feels. Yeah. So I, I like to so say, tricky, though, like to keep it really simple, if, if that seems overwhelming, if you've got any sort of discomfort after the workout the next day within the 24 hour period from doing just general lifestyle where you're not really loading the muscle at all, it's kind of in a relaxed state, then you've gone too far and you're not ready to progress yet. And you maybe want to reduce the intensity that you're exercising in that workout just to slow things down a bit. Okay. Um, in, in response to how to increase overhead mobility step-by-step -step guide, which is another one of our very popular videos, uh, Gil, aka MMA Fan 3, great information, thank you. Going full range in all movements as well as hanging helps me tremendously. If you can get a stand-up workstation at your job, do so. Sitting is the worst thing for shoulder mobility, posture and health in general. Thanks, man. Yeah, look, uh, sitting is, interestingly, they released a study recently that was suggesting that sitting is not quite as bad as what, you know, there was a lot of people saying, oh, sitting is like, as, it's, it's as bad as smoking for your health, and they kind of disproved that. Um, but it is really uh, important to sort of open up those uh, passive structures that get really sort of, um, I guess, um, set in a certain position when you're sitting and get up and move. You got to offset your sitting, and I think that's the yeah, most important thing. I think there's thing. two separate things here. There's like the general dangers of being sedentary all the time, and like certainly if you can alternate between sitting and standing, then or like even if you are sitting all day, get up and walk around every half hour, then that's going to be really good for your health. Uh, but with, in terms of shoulder mobility, like I think sitting and standing. Like, you know, there'll be a bit of a difference, but when you're standing, it's very easy to spend your whole day just like this as well. And so we've talked about uh, it's, it's the exposure to strength and mobility up in these ranges that like you just don't get from modern lifestyle. Yeah. And, and unless you're doing a stand up desk and your desk is up here and you're typing like this and yeah, you're, exactly <laughs> like, right. you're not going to be. I, I, yeah. I agree with you. I'm, like, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing. Great, yeah, but, I'm not disagreeing. But, I agree on all points here. Um, but yeah, it's, it's more about, as Phil said, getting your body moving into the movements that you just don't do when you're sitting at your desk or, st or standing at your desk, that's yeah. important. Okay, for the same video, Daniel uh, Castleberry, I'd like to see a video on anterior pelvic tilt if you haven't made one already. Um, we will look into that. I'm pretty sure we have made one, but it, it's always good to create new content anyway. It feeds the YouTube algorithm and people and just- I'm here. Yeah, that's right. And now Phil's here, so he can give us some insights on it. So we will uh, certainly do a show on that, brother. Uh, Leo Wickstrom, can you do this every day? Which is in regards to the opening of the shoulders. Absolutely, and uh, you I should. I thought you meant, should we make a video every day? I was like, hey, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. No, you absolutely can, man. Um, the exercises and drills in that are all about taking the shoulder into flexion, and we believe that if you're in um, that protracted position every day, then you should be taking it into flexion every day. So yes, the answer is yes. Andy Lawson, Bit late to the party, but I'd definitely like to some focus on hips. I'd been doing a lot more work in middle splits and pancake as my hips have often not felt like they open easily enough. However, I now seem to have an issue in my hip when I'm running, which is a new problem. Wondering if I went too far in my new workouts through, though I certainly didn't feel anything at the time, uh, at the time or after I was running. That's the same sh um, form. Uh, yeah, okay, look, here, I said this yesterday um, in a discussion with Rad and Phil, and Phil can probably um, uh, put even shed some more light on it. In my experience, as you open up new ranges of motion and new flexibility, for a period of time until you develop strength in those end ranges, you are more vulnerable. And running is a very high impact um, activity that will expose weakness if you've got it there, you know? So it's super important that when you, as you develop, and this is why our program, I believe, is so unique and so revolutionary, if I dare use that word, to how other people approach flexibility training is that our goal is not just to, uh, to increase flexibility, our goal is to develop strength in the end ranges as we increase flexibility. So it's a perfect balance of strength yeah, and flexibility. I'd say that's like spot on, but with, with running, like most of the time you are in a fairly limited range, and one that you've been you know using quite a lot before. I'd say that if you've spent suddenly more time doing more of your flexibility and more of your like focus on this sort of mobility side of things, you might have spent a bit, little bit less time running. And uh, it's yep. it's kind of that the body quickly adapts to what you spend your time doing. So if you've if you've not been uh, on your legs as much, then uh, maybe that could be part of it. I I just say with running, like definitely if you 
while you do have this more range, like really focus on if you running is your goal, getting back into doing some uh, single leg stability sort of stuff, really getting your um, your hips nice and, and strong as well as mobile. Yeah, and, and strong a, strong in the running specific range. There's, so. there's also a chance that you've injured yourself stretching too yeah. far, and now and you didn't feel it too much until you went for a run. Yeah. You know? So yeah, yeah. just take all those into consideration. Breakers thirty three breakers TV has said keep up the good work, guys. Thank you very much. If you're a guy, brother. If you're a girl, sister. Um, Martina Tanzi has said, oh my god, your videos. I love this Someone message. Is, uh, Oh my God, your videos are super useful. Thank you so much for sharing all these information and for being so detailed. I'm already half of the journey in response to a press to handstand tutorial. Can't wait to include some of your routine in my program. Thank you so much for yelling that in capital. <laughs> yeah. Someone has gone hard in the caps lock. <laughs> That's right, it's awesome. Um, Joe Chi, would you say these exercises are sufficient to achieve the splits? I think Rad answered you um, uh, in person, offline, um, in, in regards to flexibility training for adductors. Uh, the, it, it depends on your ability, and this goes for everyone. Um, doing one thing generally won't be the be-all and end-all. Progressive overload is key, so at some point your body will adapt to that one thing and you're going to need to level it up. Uh, Andy Lawson, two weeks ago, just gave us a mad thumbs up, a muscle flex, and uh, oh, that was to a story post. Uh, I think we're there now. I think that we're back to where we've been. Would love to see a deadlift specific warm up. Yeah, we spoke about this the other day. A couple of friends have, have had lower back problems from deadlifts. Yeah, this is, the, yeah, this is where we got to. Um, Jess Addison, thanks guys. Continue to love to the content. Really appreciate all the great info you put out for us. Hey, again, you cannot thank us enough because we do really enjoy the praise. <laughs> um, Peggy, fine, you may have answered this already, but can you recommend a few specific exercises for strengthening rotator? Yeah, we've done a lot of that and we're doing a lot of that right now. So watch tomorrow, we're gonna to take this to a whole new level and we're gonna um, show you how to take the stability stuff that we did today, the activation stuff that we've done, the flexibility stuff that we did yesterday and the warm up stuff we did on Monday into really developing strength in the rotator cuff and the shoulder as a whole. Um, we're gonna do that tomorrow, Phil and I are gonna be on before I uh, take off up the coast to meet up with my family and catch up with Rad. And um, yeah, guys, we're producing this into a, a wicked program that's gonna drop in the next couple of weeks. Uh, that's pretty much it for today, yeah. Remember, if you wanna dip your toe into the Unity and UMS pool, download the free flexibility blueprint. Uh, it's pretty epic. It's a great little report on some of the biggest insights we've um, discovered over the last 20 years of our training for flexibility. And also, if you wanna dive head first into the Inner Circle UMS Tribe, Get, that, get your hands on that free 30-day trial of the UMS online coaching program. Uh, the link is in the description. Until tomorrow, thanks, Phil. Everyone say thanks, Phil. Smash the like button if you do watch this video and absolutely comment and tell us where you're watching from and get your questions in. We'll answer them tomorrow. Anyway, until then, take care. Health is about performance, not just body image. You better be willing to accept what you're gonna have to do to get there. We'll start focusing on movement goals, strength goals, flexibility goals. When you nail that skill, it's there forever. The body image goal doesn't get you that it's far. It's the consistency and frequency that's going to get you there. It's not the intensity. There's no shortcuts to mastery and movement. Destination doesn't change overnight, but your direction will. It's the gym is not the place to beat up the body that you hate. It's the place to build the body that you love. We are the gym that teaches people how to move instead of just exercise because we believe that health is about performance, not just body image.